Okay, we'll see how the attendees start coming on. They come on the on the line here. And while they're joining, I am going to share my screen. Hmm, maybe not. Okay, I see we have attendees still joining, but it is 10 o'clock and I think we should get going. So I would like to say a big uh, happy September to everybody and welcome you to our month's Savvy Seniors Living Seminar. I am Dana Wilson and you are visiting us via the Savvy Seniors Living Seminar Series. And really, we're here to share the truth and the facts. It's really what East Bay homeowners want concerning later in life uh, housing issues like reverse mortgages, 55 plus senior living options, uh, selling a house in today's crazy real estate market, and or preparing to stay put and age in place right where you are now. Um, the topics that we have been presenting, um, I've been hosting since the inception of the series back in 2017, and it's, it's really for um, adults 55, 65 plus, and their caregivers and their loved ones, their family members, they're invited to join, and um, I know we've got groupies online today that have been coming since the beginning. And I also understand we've got a lot of newbies that are joining us now that we have gone online via Zoom. So it's sort of an exciting time. It's a kind of a weird, wacky time, but I'm really glad that we have um, folks here today joining us to hear some really interesting and important information about uh, the aging brain. Um, just as a, as a quick reminder, this is a free series. And for the rest of the year, we will be continuing to present the series online via Zoom. Uh, so uh, just real quickly in October, we're going to have um, how to pay for senior living. Um, November is a love letter, communicating with your adult children. And in December, we're hoping to have another panel of folks that have already downsized and they are here to tell the tale. And that's always a very, very popular one uh, for folks to attend. So I want to give a shout out to our sponsors because without them, we would not be able to bring this series to you each month and each year, year after year. So to start with, I want to give a shout out to our platinum sponsor of the year, which is Annalise Morris with the Morris Group at Merrill Lynch Wealth Management. So thank you, Annalise, for being our special platinum sponsor for 2020. We also have the Heritage Downtown, Clear Organizing, Live Home, Oakmont, Concord, and Montecito. We have Atria, Lafayette, Walnut Creek, and Valley View. Mutual of Omaha, Mortgage, Neptune Society, Pre-Planning, and yours truly, the Boomers, Zoomers, and Savvy Seniors Division of the Dana Wilson Real Estate Team. So without further ado, we're going to get started on the aging brain. And you know, it really can be difficult to know what to do if you started to notice changes in yourself in a family member, friend, and particularly when they're related to memory loss or thinking or maybe even behavior. Um, so we're here to kind of find out how to customize home care strategies uh, for family members or ourselves, learn a little bit more about what might be able to be done and um, 
you know, what to expect and what we can do for going through these changes. So um, I want to thank our wonderful panelists today, uh, Debbie and Linda, and I'm going to ask them uh, one at a time to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about who we are, who they are, what they do, and um, what they bring to the table today. So Debbie, tell us who you are and who you're with. Well, thank you for having me so much, Dana. I really appreciate it. So my name is Debbie Toth, and I am with Choice in Aging. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that has been around for 71 years, and our entire goal is to help people continue living in the community and their setting of choice, and we do that through a variety of different programs and services, but I've, I'm the, the uh, president and CEO and have been with the organization for 18, over 18 years. Wow. And what did you do before that? Do you have background in working with people? I had a life before this? Wait. Um, <laughs> so, um, actually, I, I fell in love with working with uh, the senior population when I was in high school at the Motion Picture and Television Fund Retirement Home. So, I worked there for seven years and went to college and got into financial services. Don't ask me how. Um, but after 9-11, I did an inventory of my life and I thought, the thing I love most, I'm missing. And it's working with the older adult population. So I went back to it and I've been there ever since. And I think I'll be there forever. Oh, I, I can totally relate to that myself. Um, uh, s similar experiences, just really finding out my passion and the folks that I like to work with. Um, Linda, Linda, who are you and what do you do? Well, I'm Linda Thedrini Johnson, and um, I'm a geriatric care manager and a, also a licensed family therapist. I had a business called Elder Care Services that was sold a year ago to home care assistants, helping people uh, navigate the aging journey. Um, whether there's potholes or people just want to plan proactive for uh, a good journey, uh, we help with both and we did home care and my passion is family education. I also started the very first Alzheimer respite program in the, actually in the entire Bay Area back in 1984 when people couldn't pronounce the word Alzheimer's. They called it old timers disease. Um, so I learned a lot. I was going to graduate school when I um, started that program and uh, I learned so much working with people with dementia and their families and I've been working with them ever since. So I have a career that spans 36 years, um, mostly in the San Francisco Bay Area. My new job takes me nationally somewhat before COVID. Um, but anyway, um, I still work part-time doing counseling and consultations and uh, plus flying around the country when, once I can. That's awesome. Well, again, so excited to have you both here and thank you um, in advance for your time and your wisdom and uh, the information you're going to share today. And again, the reason we bring these is to, to educate and empower people so that they, they have the facts and uh, they can make the best decisions for themselves for the short and the long term. So Linda, is it normal for us to think that we're all going to get some sort of cognitive deficit as we age. No, how's that? Um, but it is the number one fear of older adults um, because it's out there. Um, but it's not normal uh, to think that you're going to have a disease process. It is a disease process. And at some point in our conversation today, we'll talk about staying healthy and healthy brains. But uh, having a dementia um, is scary. The statistics are high. Um, one of my slides in one of my presentations showed that there's a little dip uh, in uh, the number of people diagnosed, people that are maybe in the 75 to 85 uh, range, there was a dip. So I, lifestyle changes might be making a difference. So that's the good news. Um, and I, I wouldn't worry unless you see some of the signs that you should be worried about. Interesting. So what are some of the signs that it is time to be evaluated? 
Well, the, the Alzheimer's Association has a great, you know, 10, 10 warning signs. And I'm just going to talk about a couple because memory, obviously, and all of us forget things from time to time, especially if you're stressed and overworked and doing a lot of different things at once. Everybody on this screen probably experiences memory problems from time to time. Um, but, you know, we don't constantly forget date, dates and events. But if you're worrying about, oh my God, I w missed another appointment, or, um, you know, then you remember them later, that's kind of normal. But if you keep re missing appointments and your medical provider is calling you, you might have a problem. That could be a signal. So the, the 10 signs that the Alzheimer's uh, Association has in their little checklist, it has a place for you to write down, oh yeah, that is a problem. And then you could take it to your physician and the mm -hmm. physician will send you for more testing. So memory problems, uh, challenges in planning or solving problems. And occasionally we might have a problem balancing our checkbook or you know, we might have small problems, but it's when it happens over and over again, you get turn off notices from your utilities and things like that going, hmm, I'm, I might have to look at what's going on with me or my family member. Um, difficulty completing familiar tasks at home, like doing a recipe and then stopping halfway through it and not being able to complete it or playing a favorite game that you've played forever and not knowing what that next move should be. Those are kind of warning signs. But again, we all make occasionally errors and uh, you know, we all occasionally need some help setting up a, a microwave. Maybe we have a microwave. Or for me, it says record a television show. I have so many remotes in my um, <laughs> family room. It's like, which one do I pick up? You know, one's for volume, one's for Netflix, one's for who knows. Anyway, so we all have a little bit of problems in that area, and we need to call on a teenager to help us. Um, <laughs> confusion with time and place, also trouble understanding visual images, uh, new problems with words and speaking. Again, occasionally, we all forget that word. You know, I was trying to think of a word this morning, and as I know that word, finally it came to me because I want to share it with you in, in a bit. But it's, it's not a word that I use every day, but it was a word that's in there, but it couldn't come through. And one of the things as we age, we have a lot of information in here. We have a lot of file drawers to go through before we find that word or the name of that person. So again, that's kind of normal. Those are the normal things. Uh, we all misplace things. Everybody has lost their car keys, right? Or, well, most people, if you haven't, you're not normal. <laughs> maybe maybe that, is that I should say. Um, so, or you're too obsessed with things and you got to relax and lose something from time to time because life is about quality and we can get over involved in the details of disease processes. So anyway, I would say you're going to get a copy of this. Uh, Dana's going to send it out to you. Oh, wow. And it just will guide you through and you take it to your doc and the doc will go forward. Maybe Debbie will talk to the PCPs. <laughs> nice. Yeah, Debbie, I was going to ask you, so where does one go for an evaluation? So that's a great question because not all physicians are comfortable diagnosing, let alone really assessing where you mm -hmm. are in your process if you have dementia. Mm -hmm. And so it is vital that you go to somebody who really understands and specializes in dementia. And the Kaiser has to be, the PCP refers you to their neurologist who specializes in this. You can do it at Stanford. There are Alzheimer's diagnostic centers. There's one in Walnut Creek and there are a number throughout the state, um, but you really need somebody who specializes in dementia. There is a radical underdiagnosing of dementia and Alzheimer's um, from primary care physicians because they don't study this. This is not, you know, this is part of what I say is like the underlying ageism or the systemic ageism we have in everything. If you just think about the fact that we have children's hospitals, but we don't have older adult hospitals, but 
look at the size of the population that is aging. Like, so there are all these bits and pieces to it. The good news is we, there are specialists and you can access them. And I believe that the Alzheimer's Diagnostic Center is not only being all throughout California, but you can find similar type organizations in other states as well. So if you have viewers that are tuning in from other states because they can, because you're on this great uh, platform where anybody from anywhere can join, um, it's really the most vital piece is that you go to somebody who specializes in Alzheimer's and dementia. I want to add something to what Debbie is saying. The reason why Debbie and I are saying going to a diagnostic clinic, wherever it could be, is because they have multifaceted elements to the diagnosis. They have a physician, they have a neurologist, they have a, a neuropsychologist. So it's all that testing coming uh, together to find out, does this person have something that's reversible? There are reversible dementias that could be related to diabetes or kidney disease or maybe over medication. So that's the reason why you want to go to a diagnostic clinic. And is that, again, I think Debbie... It's not a five-minute review. No. Do, and do you have it's to not have a five-minute review. Home? These are These are a series of tests. Yeah, you have to have a, re a referral from your doctor. Is that what I'm hearing? Not necessarily. You can go if to you're the at Kaiser. Yes. Yeah. What about if you're uh, at Kaiser? John you need a referral from your primary care physician. What about John Muir? John Muir, if you're in their um, capitated program, you will need a referral. But if you're regular Medicare with a co-insurance like AARP or United Healthcare, you have a right to call up Stanford UCSF or go to one of the clinics Debbie's talking about. Uh, you make the appointment on your own and you just go. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Well, and so if I'm you feel, gonna... I think, I think, go ahead. Dana, I was just going to say, if you feel like you're having trouble acting Accessing the kind of support that you need and you have Medicare, then you should go to HIP. I, I will give you the, the information, but HICAP is the Health Insurance Counseling and Advocacy Program. And um, in other states, it's SHIP, but yeah. in California, it's HICAP because we like to rename everything in California. Yeah. Um, but we have the best HICAP in Contra Costa County. So if you're having trouble navigating, getting to the right person, I would suggest that folks call HICAP and I can give you that information to send out, and Dana, you, if you haven't already. We actually had the HICAP liaison on um, last oh, month. Fabulous. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Good. So, yeah, between, Good. between the three of us, we can get everybody who is interested the right information. If we don't, mm -hmm. if we don't include it in the follow-up email, just shout out to me, and I'll make sure you get in contact with the right people, whether it's Debbie or Linda or, or someone else. Um, and I think we also wanted to ask, um, are there ways that we can keep our brains healthy? Yes. Yes. I think I will talk about some mental stimulation and maybe Linda can talk about nutrition and some other interventions, but right. mental stimulation, I have to tell you guys this story. This is the greatest story. Um, I started doing Sudoku years ago. Um, I've always loved crossword puzzles and Sudoku and word searches and just things that keep my brain going. And I went to a conference. It was an adult day um, services conference. And the presenter was talking about how the differences between doing a crossword puzzle versus doing Sudoku. So people who are doing crossword puzzles every day, you're accessing the memory part of your brain and you're not exercising it the way Sudoku does. So where you have to anticipate and figure out something new, you're exercising your brain in a very different way than you are in crossword puzzles. So if you're doing crossword puzzles and you enjoy them, keep it up. But try Sudoku. Try something that forces you, whether it's putting words together like you would on, I'm trying to think of what that game is called, where you roll the dice and you have to put together so many words with the letters that come out, Boggle or something like that. Oh, I just yeah. played it for the first yeah. time with girlfriends online. Um, and you can play Boggle on Zoom with your girlfriends. There's all kinds of really great, or boyfriends, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to discriminate against the men out there. Um, but there are games that you can play that really get your brain to think in new ways and you're problem solving. And exercising your brain in that way can be incredibly helpful. Um, dental hygiene is a huge thing. So there are so many different ways. Um, Linda, flu shots even, right? 
Yes. So that was research that just came out probably in the last month. Yeah. So That's amazing. I, I do a class and I'm doing it at the end of the month and I'll send that on to Dana too called brain remodeling. And it, in that class, besides what Debbie's talking about, definitely learning new things are, is really important. And how you learn, Debbie, is you're right. Those things that you know how to do automatically uh, you, and you really don't have to use deductive reasoning or, you know, you have to use more of your brain. Um, though they're great, but one of the things, uh, this, is a, this is the new word that I couldn't remember that was in my brain and I found it. It's epigenics. And one other thing I have found in my career is people come and maybe many of you viewers are, my mom or dad had dementia. I don't want it. What can I do to not get it? Well, that's what epigenics is about. It's ch change of life lifestyle to compete with your genetic package. So by changing your lifestyle, by your diet, and the, the diet is, I go into detail in my little seminar, but the diet is really a Mediterranean diet. So you're eating good fats, yeah. fish, uh, lots of fruit and veggies, nuts. So a, a good diet, exercise almost every day. I mean, I've really changed my lifestyle to, especially since the pandemic. I've added, you know, three days of swimming plus the, you know, five days of walking and a couple of stretching exercises videos that I watch. So, um, again, we have to be working on a lot of things like balance. You're using your brain when you're doing a lot of these exercises as well. So, so it, it and also the biggest newest thing, and I, I can't tell you how new it is, is mindfulness the impact on uh, meditation and relaxation, breathing exercises, yoga on our health is incredible. And they're seeing, what they're seeing is a reversal. Uh, there's a doctor down at UC Irvine that I heard speak and people that had diagnoses of early stage dementia, once they've made these lifestyle changes, their abilities uh, came back somewhat. I mean, it, you, you can't, uh, repair a brain cell that's died because of a disease, disease process. But then again, I heard a researcher sp talk just this last week on uh, a medication that will stimulate new brain cells and could be the answer to this. They're early in the uh, testing of the uh, drug, but no, oh, there's a lot of great research going out there, but there's a lot you can do now and don't think you can't. You can change your lifestyle. It takes some work, but you can. That is super exciting. Wow, well, thank you, both of you. Um, I've never done Sudoku. Sudoku? Sudoku. Sudoku, yes. Sudoku. And it's, it's numbers. Yeah. Listen, listen, I don't like math. Um, <laughs> once I hit geometry, I, I developed a, a deep hate for math, I will say, <laughs> but this, this is not, you look at it and you think, oh, it's numbers, it's math. It's not. It's really patterns of how the numbers appear in different boxes. Yeah. So it's, don't be, don't be frightened off. It's not math. Okay. I just want to say like that for everybody. Deductive reasoning. It. It's reasoning. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. Yeah. So, so Linda, what are some of the steps that one should take when you see these changes in a family member? What, what, can we, what can we start to do? Well, I think you keep a journal um, of what you've seen and changes. And, and think about what was happening at that time. Ha, has there just been a move? Did somebody die? You know, it could be related to grief or something. So uh, keep a journal when you've seen these things. And when they start happening um, too frequently, you might bring it to the attention of that person. But... <clears throat> Don't say you should or you need to. You say, you, the, the I message is, I'm concerned, mom, you've been forgetting appointments. I'm concerned, dad, that you're losing weight and maybe you're not skipping meals or, you know, I, you, I'm concerned. Would you go with me uh, and find out what's going on? 
and, and there's a lot of reluctance in that because who wants to get diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease? But what I want to say to that person, and I've had to work with families in this uh, kind of counseling, coaching, is to say there are medications that will help you. They help with retaining your abilities. They don't cure the disease. But there are medications that could help you. But there's lots of things that cause our memories to be fuzzy and that could be changed. It could be just a medication you're taking or maybe a food you're allergic to. Mm -hmm. um, so, so let's go find out so you could have the best life possible. So it's your approach. Is there a... Is there a food that's really interesting is there a certain food you'd heard you have heard that um tends to pop up time and time again well alcohol is the food that ah, pops, yeah. pops up most frequently i don't know if it's a food but it definitely is a contributor and there is a, a dementia actually just to alcohol abuse called corsicos dementia but it these diets, these life changes that I'm talking to you about, it, they do eliminate alcohol. Most healthy diets do. Yeah. 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 So, Debbie, why so, would we want to get testing early, um, you know, when, when a person is still caring for themselves, when the home appears to be safe to live in? Um, and maybe they're just a little memory challenged. Why might somebody want to still get tested? Uh, well, quality of life. Um, I think that uh, you can do so many different things um, about planning for your future. So um, once you start to really lose capacity, you no longer are able to make the decisions that you would want for yourself. Mm -hmm. I think um, so being able to complete your living trust, being able to um, really articulate in your durable power of attorney what you want to see happen, um, to really be able to make positive decisions about what you want to do now and today. Like, like if you knew you've got, you know, 10 more years or 20 more years or five more years, what would you do in your life? What would you want it to look like? You get to paint that picture. You also get to do the kinds of interventions that Linda was talking about. You can make changes in your lifestyle. Um, mindfulness being definitely one of them. Diet, exercise, spending more time with things that bring you joy and create positive neurochemicals in your body. Like there's mm -hmm. so many things that you can do um, that are positive. I, I look at um, Pam Montana, who is one of the like heroes of, of the Alzheimer's world. She was diagnosed young. She was a corporate executive. She had this amazing career and children and husband and life was great. And some things were starting to go wrong. And she got her diagnosis finally after, I don't know, two or three years of struggling with something's not right, but I don't know what it is. And she has just become this champion for Alzheimer's disease. She's on every drug trial there is to be on. She's raising money for the Alzheimer's Association. She's walking, she's exercising, she's blogging. She's an inspiration for people. And her family are so involved and wrapped around her. And her quality of life, I would venture to say in some areas, has increased because of it. So, I mean, I think that it provides us that opportunity. Um, I think what you really need to do, though, is honestly be sure that somebody is safe. So somebody has a, a diagnosis, um, that cues the caregiver or family members to sort of be aware of certain things in the house and fall risks and um, making sure that your diagnosis is accurate and it's not related to dehydration, over-medication, depression, anxiety, and any number of things that cause dementia-like symptoms. And again, that brings us back to, did your diagnosis come from a, an office visit with a primary care physician? Or did your diagnosis come from going through a massive amount of testing that did conclusively say that this is what's going on? So there are a lot of, you know, different pitfalls along the way if you don't ensure that you have that accurate diagnosis, that you're able to plan, and that you're able to ensure safety. Um, there are some drug treatments that work. For some folks, Namenda or Aricept may work. So you may be able to reduce the um, 
impact of the disease for some period of time on those medications. Um, yeah, so there, there are so many different reasons to get that diagnosis and to take control of what you have in your life and your mm -hmm. family. Um, I don't see that there's any downside to getting the diagnosis and start acting on it. That's awesome. That's really good information. You, and you know, I, I'm going to add one little thing. When I was running the Alzheimer's respite program, there was a gentleman in the group and he was about 65. So young diagnosed with Alzheimer's and what he told me with tears in his eyes, I thought I was crazy. And I was so glad to get the test to know it's a disease and I'm not crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's powerful. Wow. So how long, Debbie, can someone with, uh, with a dementia uh, live at home alone or with a spouse? And I think we were going to have you talk about the uniqueness of each dementia type and how it has to be individually driven. Is there anything that you wanted to add to what you just shared with us? Yeah, it's not just, it's not just the dementia type. Um, the dementia, whether it's frontotemporal Alzheimer's or some other stroke-related, Parkinson's-related, like Lewy body-related, there are so many different types of dementia, over 100 yes. different types. Yes. Alzheimer's is, is the most prevalent. Um, what is the important thing, and they all, they all behave a little bit differently in the body, but um, what's important to know, even though there are sort of parts of the brain that are impacted in each of these different dementias, and there's a certain progression of what's happening in the brain as a result of that dementia, we're all individual. We're all unique individuals, and how we respond, it's not like diabetes. Like diabetes, your blood sugar is between 130 and 150, and so we're going to put you on metformin, and you're going to take sugar and carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates, the bad carbohydrates, sorry, I might have gotten that wrong, out of your diet, and these are the things that we're going to do, and it's going to impact your blood sugar. It's not like that. It's not something that you can do because it impacts who we are, our personality, it depends on that. It depends on our physical shape. It depends on the chemicals in our body. There are so many different things, environmental factors, that, that change how each person responds to what's happening in their brain. And so I'm sorry to say, and I'm happy to say at the same time, that it's different for everyone. So not everybody, if you know somebody who had a really bad experience with their mother with dementia, that doesn't mean that that's going to be your experience with your wife with dementia or your husband with dementia. So every disease process is different in each person. And so it's vital that you are participating alongside this person and observing and making sure because the worst thing we can do is take away somebody's independence before it's time, right? We all want to live with dignity. And if I'm still totally cognitively intact, but like Linda was saying, I'm having a little bit of trouble balancing my checkbook or I'm forgetting where my car keys are. I'm at the very beginning of this and I'm just like that things are not quite right and you move me out of my home and put me into a memory care facility like that that's going to cause me to decline rapidly and destroy my quality of life so it's important to look and to see if somebody is starting to do things that aren't making a lot of sense leaving the house and getting lost things like that yeah it's time to turn the gas off in the house um, it's time to start making some of those changes and it's time to like linda referred to earlier write things down how often is this happening? What am I seeing? Are there certain triggers where this is happening? Is it that every day when you get upset because I'm not giving you your glass of wine at five o'clock anymore, that that's just causing a behavior? And if I was giving you your glass of wine, that wouldn't happen. Like, you know, so, so paying attention, documenting, um, and, and it's different in every journey. And I can't express strongly enough how important it is to either have a care manager, an elder care manager in your life, go to the Alzheimer's Association, get Get support, get help. You're not alone. I've never heard it explained that way. That's really interesting. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. Linda, what, talk, talk, talk to us about what not to do. What not to do? What not in, to do? in what respect, uh, well, Dana? Um, you know, and we, we talked about this in, our, in the questions that we were discussing as far as, um, you know, how long can someone with a 
take them and to live at home alone or with the spouse. And I think you, you, you had maybe um, ah. alluded to like making promises, something along those lines. Yeah, I ah. think. Uh, yeah, adult children and spouses make promises. I'm never going to put you in a nursing home or I'm, I'm going to take care of Aunt Susie or my husband until he's incontinent. Um, we, we, ha we put this um, boundary on when we're going to seek help. Don't do that to yourself. You'll know when the stress is too great that you'll need help. You'll either bring help in the home or it's time to consult with a geriatric care manager um, or somebody that can help you make that decision of what is it that dad or mom needs. Maybe daycare, which Debbie is um, the queen of daycare. Um, <laughs> Maybe daycare is the answer. Maybe dad or mom doesn't have enough stimulation that's appropriate for them in the home. So just doing that then changes the behavior. They're more tired at night. Uh, you don't have to make that move. So before you've made the move to put somebody in uh, a memory care, which is very expensive too. We haven't talked about that, but next month Dana is going to. Um, you know, before you make that, what other plans? As a care manager, sometimes the plan is three days a week in daycare, two days a week with the home care agency, and the weekend the family comes together and add, offers support. And if you're a spousal caregiver, there's a lot of reluctance by you guys to bring somebody in because you think you should do it, that you love this person so much, you should be able to do it. But remember in a care situation, there's eight hours, every eight hours is a change of shift. When you're at home, there is no change of shift every eight hours. You're it 24 seven, seven days a week and you don't get a lot of respite. And even though you love somebody, um, that doesn't mean you can do what they need and what you need. Uh, it's, it's time to look at how can we all have high quality of life and can, what can we change in either in our current environment or is my health at risk as a caregiver and I have to find a solution. Uh, I remember one wife that I was working with, she said, you know, if I only had two days off, I think I could do the other five. And we actually found a small residential care home that took her husband every Friday night and she picked him up on Sunday night. And she was able to care for him to the end of his life, but she had to come to what she needed to recharge her own batteries, to continue the care. So again, like Debbie said, every individual and every couple is gonna be different. Every family is gonna have different dynamics. So work with an expert, work with somebody that's gonna be able to guide you um, anyway. about putting together short and long-term plans, you know, housing related, what does that look like? Um, how long will the current home suit your needs and your abilities and your health care and your finances and your lifestyle? And I've heard people say the same thing, that they're going to wait until someone's in contact Tax. or yeah. when they can't drive anymore, or they're going to wait until you know, Joe is wandering down the street, that's when they'll know. And I think if, you, if, if people hear nothing else today, it's that, you know, make a plan and maybe don't make those promises because like Linda said, you'll know, but maybe mm -hmm. working with a care manager um, would be very helpful too. Um, so before we talk about when to bring in help, I think Debbie was going to maybe share what some community support systems might be to help individuals yeah. and families with dementia, Debbie? Yeah, we'll do. And also, your microphone got a little bit softer, Dana, for some yeah, reason. Okay. Your sound has, has just, gotten a little yeah. softer, so you may need to project more. I will um, up. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Um, so, so um, first and foremost, I always say go to the Alzheimer's Association. We have... Um, I think one of the best Alzheimer's associations in the nation um, in terms of the, the staff that work at the one 
that they're based in Lafayette in, in Contra Costa County, but they are the Alzheimer's Association, the chapter of which is Northern California and Nevada. And it's a brilliant, amazing, soulful, kick booty kind of team. They're, they're wonderful. And I think that they are always my first go-to for folks when they're concerned about it, when even before there's a diagnosis, you don't have to have a diagnosis of dementia to go to the Alzheimer's Association and say, I need support. They have a tremendous library of um, pamphlets, three, you know, the trifold pamphlets that have information about, like Linda talked about earlier, the 10 signs that you want to be looking for. They have information about what caregivers need to do. They have information about diet. They have information about exercise. They have information about what's happening in the brain. I mean, they just have a literal library of all of this facts and information because we are, the more informed we are, the better we're able to manage whatever our diagnosis is. And so I would say that's always the first stop shop. But as also Linda alluded to, there are a variety of different supports and services available in the community from somebody delivering meals to the home to somebody coming into the home to help provide care or cook meals or help clean the house or engage in activities. Um, and there are also opportunities outside the home. And, and people that come into the home, they can be um, non-skilled or they can be skilled if you need additional medical support. So there's that. And that same distinction between non-skilled and skilled versus clinical, non-clinical, when I say skilled, non-skilled, um, you can have that in a day program as well. So day programs have social day programs, and then there are adult day healthcare programs. And the social day programs are really for people who don't need the interventions of a nurse because they're not on a bunch of different medications and you're not need to monitoring if there's a wound or skin quality or things like that. So, so when you need the medical care, there's a, an adult day healthcare facility with the full same staffing that's in a skilled nursing facility, but it's in a day program. And one of the biggest barriers to people accessing day program services is this preconceived notion that mom's not going to like it or Bob's not going to like it or, you know, they're not going to enjoy that place and space. I can tell you in 18 years of working in an organization where we have an Alzheimer's daycare program, a general program, a Russian program, a Farsi program, and we have two different sites and locations in my 18 and some odd years, 18 some odd months of working in this place and space, there was one lady, one lady who came into our adult day program and she was 98 years old and she would come into the front area where you you know, say good morning, and the receptionist welcomes you, and then you go back to the day program room, she would say, I don't want to go back there. There's old people in there. I love you girls. I love you girls. The staff is great, but those are old people back there. That is the only time that I have had that happen. So break through that barrier. Take away whatever preconceived notion you have. Go and check it out. Drop in and do a tour. Not now. We're in the middle of a pandemic. But when we're past this pandemic time, because in addition to providing those day services, most of those day programs, certainly Choice and Aging's day programs do, have caregiver support groups. And we have social workers who work with the family caregivers because also, as Linda has mentioned, how that caregiver cares for themselves will impact how that dementia progresses. The better that a caregiver cares for themselves, the better that they're able to care for their loved one. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, and, and, and this is just kind of common sense, but if I'm in a bad way, how I treat my loved ones around me is not my best. Mm -hmm. And so that piece of the caregiver caring for themselves and being equipped with knowledge and education and support mm -hmm. will make all the difference in the care journey. So um, Linda can talk more about the important role of care managers in supporting people through this process because that is another really vital piece. How, I don't know, maybe we were gonna talk about that later. I'm sorry if I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll definitely cover that. I wanted to definitely ask Linda, um, when, when do I bring in help? And you know, we might as well get real and talk about what, what might the cost be 
And then how do I look for or find good help? In lots of ways. Um, and, and when do you bring on help? I, mm -hmm. I think it might be good to do earlier than later. Um, when the later you wait to bring on help, the more resistance there can be. If you do it earlier in the process, maybe Joe, I'm going to just make up a story. The husband has been just diagnosed. He's 75 years old. He's still driving and we all go, uh, but he's driving fairly safely. Um, but he can't manage a checkbook. He can't do the things that take a lot of cognitive processing, but the guy's pretty social. So getting him a companion, not a caregiver, it's going, your success rate is going to be higher if you don't use the word caregiver. Um, personal assistant, a trainer, uh, a golf buddy. I, with these guys and some of the women uh, that I've made those connections with, uh, families, we found like the trainer really works for men. Um, and a personal assistant for uh, a woman that takes her shopping, but doesn't start doing any cooking for her until a relationship is made. The second part in the success of hiring a caregiver is building the relationship with that person. Uh, so you might not, you might use a, what we call as a therapeutic fiblet. Uh, when you call a trainer instead of a caregiver, even though it's coming from an agency, that's a therapeutic fiblet. You're, you're kind of twisting the truth, again, to reduce anxiety, to build self-esteem, and reduce stress for you and that person. That's why you use therapeutic fiblets. So you're using this fiblet and this guy, this companion comes and takes the guy to hit a bucket of, of balls. He can't play golf anymore, but he can do that. So he's really looking for, you know, Joe, the college student to come those two days a week. The wife has some time off to go play bridge or maybe take a nap while her husband's out of the house. So you, you do it earlier when somebody is more high functioning, they're used to having somebody in the home um, and those are the successful caregiving models. You wait too late. I do a, a national support group with caregivers from all over the country, and they're all trying to bring in care when mom or dad is just resisting having anybody in their house. They think they're going to steal. You know, there's all this fear that's unfounded. Most of the people who work as caregivers, definitely they, in California, they're all registered. They're all screened. They're all you know, fingerprinted, uh, they're not criminals. I can't say that no one's gonna ever not take anything because people are bad sometimes, but the majority of people are absolutely wonderful having had 200 caregivers on my staff at one point in my life. Uh, just care from the heart and that they have training in dementia. They know about therapeutic fiblets and when to use them and not to use them. Um, so, and, and if you're, Trying to find an agency right now with COVID, it's challenging because some of the agencies won't staff unless you um, want 40 hours a week or 20 hours a week. And I'm telling you, don't start with so much. Start slow and then build up. Um, but with COVID, they want to send one person one place that's been screened and is using protection. So. It's a kind of a strange time. And I guess if you're working with a care manager or maybe the Alzheimer's Association has a good pamphlet, they're such a great resource um, for this kind of challenge too. They're here at all the time and sharing stories, being in a support group. And I remember once in a support group I was running, a gentleman said, you know, I can't give my wife a shower because she thinks, you know what we're gonna do. And I want to just get her clean. <laughs> and then an, another woman said, or, or was it? No, it was a guy taking care of his wife. He said, a, a woman taking care of her husband. I cannot bring any repair people in the house. He gets so angry if he sees somebody because he thinks he does it. So when he's at day program, 
I get the repair people in and I thank him for keeping the house in good order. Well, he's not keeping the house in good order. She's getting it done by repair people, but his self-esteem has been built by everything working in this beautiful home. So again, it's, it's strategies and techniques for both the caregiver. And again, as Debbie said, it's about quality of life. If you've read the book, Being Mortal, it's about living until you die, even if you have dementia and you should see my power of attorney. It, it's in detail what I want if I have dementia. You know, give me my garden, my pets, and a high fence so I can't climb over it. I can't climb over any fence anyway, but I maybe <laughs> if I had <laughs> dementia, I might try. I don't know. Um, but that's what's important to me, so I have it in my legal documents. <sighs> it's about quality of life. Even we're talking about brain health and brain unhealth. Um, what we all want to aim for is the highest quality of life possible. So what, what is all this going to cost? Uh, a caregiver in Contra Costa County, I would say the average is about $30 an hour. Um, if you have long-term care insurance, uh, you might use that. You might need an advocate like HiCap to help you use it. I had a really fight for a client of mine because the health insurance, long-term care, care insurance, sent out a nurse to evaluate my client who could not live alone because she'd burned the place down. Um, and he said she was just fine and uh, they stopped giving her the long-term care insurance to pay for assisted living. So again, you bring in high cap. Um, I was able to argue it fairly, su very successfully because I had her retested by a neuropsychologist um, and surely she had advanced Alzheimer's, but there's a nurse that came in and did, it was like Debbie said, it was like 20 minute evaluation and asked her, you know, did the, there's a small test that a lot of people do and she's pretty good on that, but she is not safe to live alone. So again, um, your long-term care insurance will cover it. You're going to, you do finances for it next month, D Dana. Uh, you know, reverse mortgages and other kinds of instruments to help with money. But for me, as I said earlier, when I'm doing a plan with somebody that's um, moderate income, I want to know what their diagnosis is, what their health status is. Do I think they're going to live five? I have a crystal ball. I don't really, but I, I have a good, um, good experience, I guess. Are they gonna, do I project they're going to live five years or 10 years or 20 some people with dementia, you know, they don't have any stress. They live a really long life because they don't have to worry about paying taxes or the pg e bill or the gardener. They're just in the moment and they're pretty happy. So they live a long time, no stress. Um, so what can I project? And then it's like, well, maybe a combination of a day program and as I said earlier, and a caregiver only a couple times a week. Um, again, <laughs> Every family, every individual situation is going to be different, but it's going to be costly. There is a cost. Yeah, and it is uh, not cheap. It's like, what, five times as expensive on Medicare for somebody with a dementia diagnosis than for somebody without. It is a costly endeavor. And so you do want to plan ahead. You do want to have long-term care insurance and start that when you're younger, if it's possible. And I would say, too, what Linda said about combining the caregiving at home as well as the daycare. The daycare has this incredible um, socialization aspect to it also. So it's a, it's, a, it's a different layer when you're in a group activity setting and where everything is designed around the disease process. So the activities are short in duration. There aren't open-ended questions. You're not competing with other people to discuss current events. Like everything is really designed around maximum emotional happiness because the memory may be gone, but the emotion center is still intact. And so to the extent that you can leave people with that happiness and you have a group of professionals who surround this person who are all trained in this and it costs significantly less. Mm -hmm. So somewhere between 100 and 130 for a full day is still with in a health model where you have the entire staffing of a skilled nursing facility um, so that they're getting medical interventions as well as support going to the bathroom, walking, eating, all of that fun stuff um, is less expensive than in-home care. But sometimes you need in-home care. I mean, it's a really good, there's so much out there you can put together the patchwork while looking at what the person needs as well as what you can afford. 
And, and Debbie and Dana, one of yes. the things I, that just came to me, and because a, a client called and said, "Linda, I can't, I can't deal with her. His wife had dementia. I can't, I can't do it anymore. I'm 83. I have my own problems. I'm just exhausted." And when he told me about all the change of status, I said, "Well, you're entitled to Medicare home health, and when we have a um, when we have a situation." that is a change of status you can bring ask your this is where you can ask the pcp to order the medicare home health or you can call a home health agency and he got all kinds of support then a social worker came in oh. uh he got some respite help he got a day a weekly nurse they um looked at her meds and changed her meds i mean he and now he's going to be moving on to hospice but you know, I think we forget that there, there are government entitlements like Medicare, when to use it and how to use it. That's what a lot of the families don't know. But any change of status and the person is homebound usually gives you the open door to using Medicare home health. So, okay, so we, and, and I wanna just point out to all of our attendees today that um, Debbie and Linda have very graciously agreed to go over a little bit today. So if you want to stay tuned for just a little bit, um, we are going to continue because this is one of those topics where there's just a lot to cover. Um, and I might skip down a, a couple sections because I wanna talk about, um, I definitely want to talk about behaviors that might prevent us from finding a good uh, care community. Um, I wanted to talk about something that Linda and I talked about, which is uh, managing anxiety specifically during COVID and uh, a little bit more about safety in the home and when do you know, like when, uh, when is it the right time or when is it a better option to move? Um, so uh, anyway, I just wanted to let people know that we're not going to have a hard stop today at 11. If you need to jump off because you've got another another Zoom <laughs> class or something, then uh, we certainly understand. But uh, you can hang with us until we end, and um, we will finish up as soon as possible. Um, so, so let's go to when is it a better option to move? And I don't know which one of you wants to to kind of spearhead that question? Well, the better option is, we just talked to that home care is expensive. Yeah. Now, dementia care is expensive, but we also have the option of small residential care homes where people can kind of negotiate a fee easier than you can with a big um, assisted living. We're looking at $10,000 a month in a dementia unit. They're expensive and it could be more, uh, maybe a little bit less, but that's a good average fee. So that's a lot of money. Um, and so there are other options there. Um, and so if you're paying $30 an hour for round the clock care for somebody, that is way over $10,000 a month and you're going to run out of money. So sometimes it's the budget that that causes the move. And sometimes it's maintaining a home. Maintaining a big home with a garden and you know maybe a steep driveway, uh you know, it's just too much for people who are frail, not not just have dementia. So it's it's the environment or it's the finances or it's the caregiver burden. Those are the, the three major reasons why you would make a move. Um, and you well spouses out there, I have worked with too many well spouses that die before their family member with dementia. So you've got to do self care. You can't wait till you're just broken uh, spiritually and physically. You have to make the, this move sooner. And, and, Medi-Cal does pay for skilled nursing, not, well, there are some, uh, there's some waivers, but those waiver facilities and assisted living for people with dementia have waiting lists. Uh, that's why, as Debbie was saying, to plan earlier, if you're low income 
or middle income or wife or husband is worried about their own aging, you want to do this research way before the need. Um, so those are the times that you have to face a move. Um, and, you know, it could be a crisis like we're in a pandemic. It could be a fire. It, I, I don't know what's going to cause a move, but there's going to usually be an opportunity for a move. We do our best as geriatric care managers, as community uh, nonprofits to keep people in their home because that's where they want to be. And, and that's yeah. usually our goal. Yeah, and I would, I would add that a move almost always when somebody is in the mid to later stages of Alzheimer's disease can cause a cliff effect. And so to the extent that people don't want to have their loved ones sort of, you know, a big life event, whether it's getting on a plane and flying to Hawaii and being in a completely unknown space or moving into a new home can be, can be a trigger for a cliff event. And so people take that into consideration as well. And I would just say, if you're planning on moving because you're downsizing for the reasons that Linda mentioned, so you're not able to navigate and take care of this big house, you have stairs in the house, there are fall risks in the house, it's hard to get into the shower, like there's all these different things and you decide that you want to move to a smaller home, that maybe it's a possibility that you work visiting that home before you move into it if it's a vacated home if you can find a vacated home, mm -hmm. that you can go to that house and have a picnic lunch and you can go to that house, you know, so that there's a few times so that when you actually do move into it, it's not such a strange place. Mm -hmm. um, but it has to be repeated if the person is in the mid to late stages. Um, and I would say that that um, medical, so, so aging, if you have dementia, um, you have a leg up if you're really wealthy and you have a leg up if you're extremely poor and if you're anywhere in between it's really hard to navigate this is just i'm just saying that's the reality medi-cal has payments and supports for certain programs and systems and living in skilled nursing facilities or assisted living facilities and as linda said people don't necessarily want to live there they'd like to live at home and so that's our always go-to but they can get support doing that and if you're really wealthy you can afford it and if you're in the middle you're going to struggle. So plan, plan, plan. Plan, plan, plan. That's that's my mantra on my soapbox as well. Plan, plan, plan. I think this is so interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you, Debbie, about um, how do you see that what has been important in one's life continues though they have deficits in thinking, remembering, and processing? And I think we talked before about maybe things like like music, for instance, or cooking. So talk, talk about that. So to me, in my experience of working with uh, folks with mid to late stage dementia, uh, there's no greater gift than you can give them than music, puppies, and babies. <laughs> These are just like our, our go-tos, right? <laughs> So I'm gonna I'm gonna get into a little more detail, but the the first thing, um, music. So you can, we do naturally. Our life is created by this soundtrack of music. How many times have you been in a store and a song comes on and it brings you back to when you were 16 years old and you were in such and such locate? Yeah. Like it transports you to a time and place. Yeah. So that music memory is still alive in us and. When you bring in music that people knew when they were younger, because with Alzheimer's disease, it's your short, then your mid, then your long-term memory that goes. When you bring back music, you can have somebody who's completely nonverbal sing an entire song. Imagine what that's like when you don't have the ability to articulate or get words to come out of your mouth, and then you can sing like a whole song like this this goes back to that dignity and that independence and how do you create opportunities for that? That's right. one aspect of music, that joy. But the other thing that you can do is use that music to get you through your day from in the morning where it's going to be like light chipper music you can have playing on in the background of whatever it is that you're doing. And then you want to get out and exercise. So you want the energy level up a little bit. You might play some patriotic songs to get the heart going, go out on a walk, come back home. Now we're going to have lunch. So we have a little classical music because we're going to calm down after our walk. Like you can choreograph your day with that music and it will feed the mood. So music absolutely has to be a part of 
planning around this person's life. Like it just has to be. Um, babies and puppies just bring joy. And remember what I said about that emotion, that emotion stays. Um, it won't be babies for me, FYI. I like older people, not little people. I've raised three children, but that's not my go-to, um, which is important to know, right? Because if somebody starts putting me in a room with children and I have dementia, I am not going to be a happy camper. So this brings us to our next place in space. If you've planned, like Linda has, and it says every single color she wants to wear and how much makeup you and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> then you're going to know exactly what to do. But if they haven't done all of that, having the people who know this person mm -hmm. be around them and say, like my son would say, my mommy doesn't like to go out of the house without makeup on. So you better make sure she has at least mascara on the top. Like having the people around you who can ensure they know you, they know what you've loved all life. I'm not going to want to go out of my house in sweatpants. That's just not me. But that may be somebody else. So don't dress them up to go to daycare have them in their sweats. That's their comfort zone. So, so having the people around you, if you haven't planned and you haven't been as meticulous as Linda, having those people be able to, what was, a, I was a pilot. Well, let's get me a gigantic coffee table book of all the different airplanes we've had throughout the history and modern day and cockpits. So what were my areas of interest and how do we fill those around my life? If I was a homemaker, Maybe you give me a basket of laundry and I'm folding clothes all day and I feel like I'm accomplishing something. Mm -hmm. This is not me, Dana. I'm just saying an example. <laughs> Debbie yeah. doesn't do laundry. That was That's my mother. My me, <laughs> me right. neither. Don't give me a basket right. of laundry. I'll run away from home. And you can do activities with your loved one, like cooking. So they don't have to be using the flame in the stove. They can be rolling the dough. They can be putting their hands in and mixing things up in a like there's just so much you can do when you look at what that person has loved and enjoyed over their lives and don't let just that prohibit you or limit you because some people can paint and never knew they could and you give them watercolors and a canvas and they can paint like don't limit yourself i would say try all those things that you know they love and don't limit yourself to that because there may be other things mm -hmm. Wow. That's, that's hopeful. I like that. Um, thank you. I, I've got one other thing I wanted to make sure that we covered, and, and it was something that we ended up our discussion with when we were talking about today's presentation and discussion, and that was um, managing anxiety. Um, and I don't know, uh, Linda or Debbie, if you want to take this, and then talking a little bit more about safety in the Oh, um. we had already talked about safety, but I'll, I'll, I'll tackle anxiety. Okay. One of the things with anxiety in somebody with dementia, with their restless, they're wringing their hands and they're worried. Um, sometimes that's an indicator of a health condition. There's something going on that they can't articulate to you. So that's one red flag that you want to get checked out and Obviously, one of the things that increases dementia-like symptoms is infection, and the most common infection we see is urinary tract infections, mm -hmm. but the person doesn't have any other symptoms other than restlessness and anxiety. So you want to get that checked out, especially in women. Uh, it happens in men too, but especially in women. Um, and then anxiety you need to be a detective when there is anxiety, especially if it's new. If the person's been anxious all their life, you're probably not gonna change it. You're gonna try to make a calm environment. Debbie talked about different things during the day and introducing things. Um, there's aromatherapy, which says in the morning peppermint, at noon it's pine, and in the evening it's lavender uh, to calm people down. So again, the, the peppermint and the you know, that's more stimulating to get you go going in the morning. But so with anxiety, when you're being a detective, when does it happen? What's happened in the environment? Are you letting your family member watch the news, which I say is a no-no. You cannot, especially when there's fires going on or, you know, uh, the news loves, um, negativity the news is full of negativity the last five minutes of the news program usually has a nice story you might only talk turn it on then they usually have a human interest story that's got puppies or babies in it um <laughs> i'm sure um but anyway i 
again, what's happening in the environment? Is there somebody new that you brought into your house? Um, we've got the pandemic. What about masks? That's really problematic in dementia care. Um, I think in most places they're not even trying to use them in the assisted living because they just, they, they, they're going to take them off. They don't understand why. Um, and I think it's, it's got to be scary for people. So um, you can say there's a bad illness, but they're not going to quite understand that. So if you're in your own home, you're not going to need to wear a mask there. But if anybody comes to visit you, they're going to have a mask on. You might want to have them social distance, or maybe you take your family member and you do all that visiting outdoors again to try to diminish the, the containment or, or, or contain it and ask that visitor not to wear the mask, but keep it a distance. And hopefully that visitor is free of COVID symptoms. So this is a more challenging time right now, but you've got to be a detective when anxiety presents itself. And if it's presenting in you, family caregiver, it's time to talk to a therapist about your anxiety. You might need medication and you just might need a support group. I can't tell you the value of support groups uh, to reduce anxiety because you're not alone. You're not the only one that wanted to lash out at your family member. Uh, you can't feel guilty about having any feeling that you have. They're all valid and you get validated in support groups. And if the support group you're going to, maybe you're even taking an antidepressant and it's not working, talk therapy. Because so many people, I think of a gentleman that he put his wife in dementia care. Again, these people are 90 years old. The couples are 90. They can't do it. He puts her in dementia care and he comes to the support group and he says, I'm crying all day long. I did this to my wife. And so I gave him homework. <laughs> You're going to like this homework. I told him to write 100 times, Betty's dementia put him in happy home write it 100 times he came back to the next support group and he said he was cured <laughs> oh, oh, oh. that's perfect i love that i never even thought about that but i think that people think they've done it to a loved one but it's a disease process yeah. and we're all human and we all have a breaking point and we have to come to terms with i didn't do that but it's a disease process that i couldn't stop because i'm not god oh. Well, you know what? I want to make sure that if we have any questions. I see you have some. Well, let's see. And I, it, mostly it was um, people wanted to make sure that they could hear me. Um, <laughs> oh. oh, okay. Tell me they couldn't hear me. It, does anyone have a question? If you do, write in the Q&A um, now, and we will make sure that Debbie and or Linda address your question. Um, and I won't say who's asking the question. If you want to ask something, it'll be anonymous. Um, and if as, as people are thinking about what they might want to write again, we will follow up with an email with some good information, some links, as we promised, uh, with the contact information for both panelists today. And um, let's see, I think I see a couple questions here. Will there be handouts? Um, we will, again, have some links and such that we will share. Um, do you have any references in Southern California? And I'm not quite sure references to what, I guess just Alzheimer's in general. If somebody, yeah, there's the Alzheimer's Association is throughout the country. Okay. Um, aging Life Care, <clears throat> aginglifecare.org is the organization where you can find a geriatric care manager who could be your Sherpa, your navigator into all the systems in Southern California. Um, and because I'm a past president of that national association, I, I personally know people all over the country. So if somebody sends me an email, I will find them a person. Wow, that's awesome. Okay. That I would good. add that no matter where you are in California, you can pick up your phone and call 800-510-2020 and you will be connected to whatever county or public service area that you're in. You'll be connected to the information and assistance line that is funded by the Older Americans Act 
and it will uh, connect you to somebody who knows all of the resources in that area. Because just like real estate, um, elder care is location, location, location. It's different in every one. Mm -hmm. What services there are, how great they are. Like I already said, we have the best Alzheimer's Association up here in Northern California. But um, they will know boots on the ground, what's available in that community and be able to refer you specifically to that as well. And it's a free service. That's awesome. And somebody also mentioned National Aging in Place Council is in Southern California. That's a national uh, website and you go there and put in your zip code and they give you consultants all over the country. Okay, awesome. And then we do have a question about um, your opinions on CBD, is that helpful to older people? And I, and I would assume they're asking in relation to a dementia of some sort. Debbie, I, I, I have a client that's on it. She, she is mid, early to mid-stage dementia, but she takes it because of post-polio and pain. Uh, not for her dementia. And I haven't seen any change in her dementia. The COVID uh, isolation, I've seen changes because she can't socialize, but I haven't seen that her dementia has been assisted by it. I don't know about you and the day program. <clears throat> um, so I don't know of any of our families or participants that are using it, but I have a sort of rule of thumb um, around different things that we use. And whether it's a fiblet or CBD or a glass of wine, um, if somebody's in the mid to late stages of the disease process and you are doing your level best to um, allow them to experience joy, contentment, and happiness, um, as long as it doesn't hurt somebody else, there's no reason not to try it. That's my rule of thumb. If you are not hurting somebody else and it's an attempt to bring joy, happiness, calmness, whatever it is, a positive impact to life. Why not try it? I mean, step outside yourself. I tell people this all the time because I, when I led support groups years ago, um, it's been a while since I've done it, but when I would lead support groups, um, that fiblet concept was really hard, particularly for folks who were very religious. Like I have promised God that I will not lie or I have made a promise or, you know, this, 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 that they can't lie. And I think the, the thing is this, if, if your son died and you heard that news and it just devastated you, and then eight minutes later you forgot because you have mid to late stage dementia, and then you ask, where's Johnny? And your wife says he died. And you're playing repeat on that. That is damaging to everybody involved. So if you can't lie, if you can't say Johnny's going to be here in 10 minutes, I'm excited to see him. If you can't go there with that lie, then you can redirect. Oh, um, I'm not sure. Let's go here. I need your help on this. Mm -hmm. And you just redirect. You've got seven to eight minutes to focus on something else and that thought's gone. So um, whatever tool in your toolkit that you have, if it's not harming somebody, take that tool out and use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Awesome. Same advice I give. That's awesome. Well, you ladies, <clears throat> I can't thank you enough. Um, this has been very enlightening, very, very helpful. Um, we covered a lot of ground and we, we only went over a few minutes, but um, I'm sure everybody that uh, tuned in today really appreciate uh, all that you shared and your wisdom and your experience. And I'm just very thankful that you were part of uh, September's seminar. So thank you, thank you again. And um, I wish everyone in attendance today a, a beautiful day, a wonderful September. And until we meet again in October, be well, be safe, be happy. And call any of us if you have any questions at all. Sure. And again, thank you both, Linda, Debbie, thank have you. a great day. Thanks for having us. Yeah.